This is the power supply from a Denon receiver. More specifically, it's a switched mode power supply from an AVR X6200W. I was asked to look at this because the Denon no longer powers on, and the owner thinks this may be the reason. It's obviously a lot more economical to send this little power supply to me than the entire unit. That makes good sense. So in this video, I'll test this power supply. If it works, great. If not, I'll fix it. But regardless, we'll go through some switch mode power supply theory, and we'll take some measurements around this specific power supply to try and bring that theory to life. So let's get testing. So what do we need to test? This power supply has two functions. The first is to provide low voltage, specifically 5.2 volts DC, via pins 2 and 3 from this connector. The second function is to provide 120 volts AC from this connector, but only when the main CPU has given its command via pin 1 of this connector. Let's start by testing the low voltage. Before we get started, switch mode power supplies are notoriously dangerous to work on, so please only work on one if you know what you're doing. I have my multimeter connected to pins 2 and 5, so we should read about 5.2 volts. It's powered on. Let's take a look. Right now we're at 4.6 volts, and the voltage is falling. Let's continue watching and see what happens. So it got to about 4.4 volts, and then it spiked back up to 4.9, and it's starting to fall again. So does this mean there's a problem? Well, maybe. Sometimes power supplies like this do need a load in order to work properly. So let's see if it can power an LED. We'll start with a red LED and a 162 ohm resistor, which should provide about 20 milliamps of current to the LED. I'm also still monitoring the DC voltage. I powered it on recently, which is why there's still voltage there. Let's turn it on and see if this small load makes a difference. So the LED is on, but it's pulsing. And the pulsing coincides with some oscillation from the voltage itself. So it seems like the power supply is trying to work. Maybe we still just don't have enough load on there. What about two LEDs? With two LEDs, we're still pulsing, but the frequency looks to have increased. Let's kick this up a notch. To the circuit, I've added this 8 ohm 50 watt resistor. This should draw more than 600 milliamps, which is more than 10 times the current that these two LEDs have been drawing combined. Let's see if that's enough. Look at that. Our two LEDs are bright and stable. And our DC voltage is stable at 5.25 volts. So indeed, there's just a minimum load that this power supply needed to get started. And it seems to be working just fine, at least for the low voltage DC. Let's check the high voltage AC. On this power supply, when pin one of this connector sees the high signal, or 5.2 volts in this case, this relay will engage and we'll get 120 volts AC from the output. This green cable is connected to pin one, so I'll contact that with our 5.2 volt rail here, and we should hear a click. Seems to work just fine. But let's see if this can actually power anything. This is the lamp from a Pioneer PL71 turntable I've been working on. Let's see if it can power that. Indeed. You can hear the relay engage. The lamp is glowing brightly. Our 5.2 volt indicator LED is still glowing brightly over here. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this power supply. There's nothing more I can test. Let's go over some switch mode power supply theory. With the internet, you can definitely go as deep as you want down the switch mode power supply rabbit hole. For this, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible and break it down to three steps. Step one is input rectification and filtering. This is done with one or more diodes or a bridge rectifier and one or more capacitors. This step transforms the incoming AC voltage to DC voltage. Let's take a look at this on the scope. For all of these measurements, I'll be using a differential probe, which is one of the safer ways to test a switch mode power supply. Right now I'm at the times 50 set point, so anything we read on the screen, we just multiply by 50. Here's our incoming AC waveform. It's definitely not a perfect sine wave. We're reading somewhere around 2.5 volts RMS. If we multiply that by 50, we're at just over 120 volts RMS, exactly what we'd expect. 
Because the output from step one is connected electrically to the input to step two, I will not be using the scope for this measurement, but the multimeter. And right now we're looking at about 168 volts DC. This is exactly what we'd expect. If this is confusing, you'll want to look up some information about the difference between RMS voltage and peak voltage. Step two is high frequency switching. What's involved here is a control IC, one or more integrated or external transistors, and a power transformer. The function of this step is to convert the output from step one, the DC, back into AC. But we're no longer talking about the low frequency 60 hertz that we have here. We're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of cycles per second. It does this by pulsing the DC on and off via the control IC through the primary of the transformer. From the secondary of the transformer, we will get a different voltage that's related to the turn ratio of the transformer. So let's take a look at this on the scope. I'm probing across the primary of the transformer, and we can see three discrete cycles of pulsing the voltage on and off. Take a look at the time scale, 10 microseconds. So this is a very high frequency. And let's take a look at the RMS voltage for reference. This isn't a very accurate scope, so it bounces around a lot. But let's say it's somewhere between 700 and 900 millivolts. Let's just say 800 millivolts average on the primary. Let's see if this looks any different on the secondary of the transformer. Here's what's at the secondary. My time scale is the same, 10 microseconds, and we still see three discrete cycles. This makes sense, the frequency has not changed. But take a look at the RMS voltage. We're at around 70 millivolts. This is about one-tenth of what was at the primary, so the voltage has been stepped down. And the final step, step three, output rectification and filtering. This is very similar to step one. We again use one or more diodes or a bridge rectifier, one or more capacitors, and maybe some other filtering components like inductors. This will transform the AC voltage from step two back into DC voltage. And we know what to expect here, about 5.2 volts in this case. Let's identify some of the components associated with these three steps on this power supply. For step one, input rectification and filtering. Our rectifier is a full wave ridge rectifier here. And our filtering is done by one single capacitor, the largest capacitor on the board. For step two, high frequency switching. Our control IC is mounted to this heatsink. The transistors are internal to the control IC and our power transformer is located here. And step three, output rectification and filtering. We have a large package here mounted to the heatsink. This contains two diodes, this is our rectification. And then all three of these capacitors are for filtering. That'll do it for the switch mode power supply. If there's a topic you'd like to see me dive deeper into, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.